So today we're going to look at uh, Resolver. I've got a Copley Zenith uh, dash R XPL XCL dash R Resolver drive. Uh, I got the Parker motor here with Resolver. You can see the motor power wire is separate from the feedback cable. Uh, that's good. Uh, the one thing I like about Resolvers, uh, besides being extremely rugged, is that you can have very high temperatures. So even if the motor case gets up to 150 degrees Celsius, the resolver can deal with it. Uh, sometimes the encoder just doesn't like that high temperature. Um, the other thing is uh, the cable here is pretty long. Uh, I've actually tested these systems up to 800 feet. So, you know, the length of a football field, why not, right? Like. It's just a sine and a cosine signal coming back from the feedback device. Now, in this system here, uh, I found that the, uh, the shield was not connected at this end, which is the drive end. So there's an open between here and the, the shield. However, the shield is connected to the motor case, so it does find a path to earth, but through the case of the motor back to the drive, that's kind of... Um, the electrons will still find their way down the signal. So, so this is why we see, uh, you know, several volts of PWM noise on, on the shield. And of course, in this system, uh, we maybe the motor wasn't bolted or the earth wasn't. We blew up the resolver input, right? I've never seen this before, uh, but I imagine that by wiring it wrong, there's an opportunity that we could damage the drive. Um, there's always, uh, you know, the first time ever. Uh, so that's why we're investigating this today. Um, we're going to take a quick peek at uh, you know, the motor here. So it's a resolver motor, and they've got a pinout for sine and cosine. You know, it's a differential pair of sine, cosine, and an excitation. We excite it, and there's a temperature, and, of course, the shield gets connected to the drive, not the motor case. Uh, but the basic idea is this transformer gets the excitation. And as we rotate through zero and 90 degrees, the rotor, uh, okay, this is the primary rotary, and then this is the stationary secondary. Okay, uh, you call your stator the stator, that's the thing that stands still on the road of the road or the thing that moves. Either way, you get a sine and cosine coming back. A uh, quick peek at the Copleys. We've got Argus dash R. We've got uh, Zenus and Excelnet dash R. Uh, all the uh, the plus drives have a resolver option. Um, we'll talk some more about that. But the basic idea of a resolver is that it's a winding, right? And then so this gets mounted on the stator with the cables. And then you rotate uh, the rotor, so the stator and the rotor, and the signals are excited and picked up by this part and they're induced through the rotor. Um, this is a little bit of theory of operation from the Colmorgan guys. Um, <clears throat> glad it's not in German. But again, you can see as the stator stays still and the rotor or the, the rotor rotates, uh, you get a different pickup for either mutual inductance, full signal gets through for a sine wave or none. Right. If it's 90 degrees, it doesn't nothing gets through. And so here's the excitation of a of a high frequency sine wave like eight kilohertz or 20 kilo, 10 kilohertz. And then the coils pick it up as a modulated sine or cosine and sine wave, which gets demodulated in the drive. And you get a nice sine and a cosine, which makes a nice circle once per rev circle. Typical. Uh, there's a little bit of math that goes on with uh, demodulation and picking out your values, and then you get the position. Uh, they have a, a resolver to digital converter. Uh, Copley has one of these too, by the way. But uh, the idea is that you get the resolver and you convert it to digital. Um, good, good resolution. Uh, so many, so many bits of resolution, but it's, it's an awfully big board, but you put your resolver in and you can, you can, you know, analyze it. Uh, just a quick peek at the Copley. Our resolver board is 15 millimeters by 20 millimeters and module customers can design this as a chip in their system. 
or with the encoder drive that takes like this C or SSI clock and data, you can put the resolver in and get uh, get the digital signal out. So uh, resolver in, uh, digital out, clock and data. Um, so just a note on the wiring, we show the shield, the outer braid connected to the frame, nothing connected to the motor case, which is a good way to do. The motor finds a path to earth, of course, you know, through the green yellow wire that goes to frame ground. So the case finds a path to earth, but not through the feedback shield. Uh, I would propose that the inner shield get connected to signal ground. So we show this in some of the more modern uh, inner sh foil shield twisted pairs individually shielded signal ground. It doesn't matter. Usually it's just a single braid or a foil with a wire and just don't connect it to the motor case, right? So I'll put a big red X here. Um, let's take a look at the uh, typical Tamagawa. So you've got uh, uh, 10 kilohertz. I mean, whether we do 8 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz, it doesn't matter, right? A transformer has like a decade of... Uh, you know, transfer ratio, so you're not going to attenuate until you're down to like 1K or up to 100K, so a wide bandwidth for uh, uh, distribution of uh, excitation back to sine and cosine. You'll find that the winding for the excitation, maybe that measures 50 ohms, and then the sine cosine, maybe that measures 100 ohms. That's a good trick for troubleshooting. Use an ohm meter, right? and then braided outer shield goes to frame of the drive. A high dielectric, uh, this one's rated for 120 degrees C, but some of the Tamagawas can go up to 50 degrees C. Um, this is a typical one that you might see on a Baldor motor, so it's a little Japanese enclosed resolver circuit in there, and it has an excitation. Um, the RMS value, we're gonna output like a few volts RMS, like I think it's like four volts RMS. So, you know, as long as it's not going to burn up, right? If this was a two volt RMS uh, resolver, I'd be worried, right? But all these are higher voltage RMS. Um, so you're not going to burn it up. The frequency is fine. The resistance is fine. So you're not going to overload it. Um, so they're, they're, they all have a wide range. I mean, here's a maximum speed opera, uh, operation, 30,000 minutes to the minus one. We'll, we'll, tran we'll convert that later, but look, it's a high temperature. I mean, some of these can go to 200 degrees Celsius. Um, so we're going to take a look now at CME and go through the basic setup. Um, so how to configure this brushless rotary motor with resolver. I mean, you can hook up anything. A Copley serial resolver will be on this list soon. And uh, you could do incremental. So buy the resolver drive and use it for whatever. Uh, 16,384 counts per rev. Uh, you can double this number, 65536 for the resolution. The effective number of bits might not be that good, uh, but it is a 14-bit uh, type of uh, resolution, a good effective number of bits. You can extend the resolution, but it might be a little noisy. One resolver cycle. Some of the resolvers are multi-speed, so you could have two resolver cycles for one rev of the motor. Maybe I got a four-pole motor with two electrical cycles. That works out real nice. So multiple multiple pole motors may find multi-speed resolvers. Um, you can emulate the output, so resolver in, encoder out. Um, so just, you know, got the data for the motor, did the tuning. Uh, so we're going to take a look at doing a, a single turn rev, 60 RPM uh, profile. So just a one rev move. And I'm going to monitor voltage sine and voltage cosine. Now you can do this by hand. You can just disable the drive, turn the motor, and watch the, the sine and cosine coming in. Um, but it's all working now, so I'm going to make a move. And you should see a sine and a cosine here. So there's the profile in magenta. We make the move, a little bit of following error. And you can see the nice sine wave and cosine wave. At this sampling rate, uh, you can see the modulation in, uh, in, in this signal. But just demodulate it in your mind. You can see the sine and the cosine for uh, a, a single move. Um, if we take a look at... The, uh, the resolution here of the feedback device, uh, you can see what the, 
that was a single turn move here. And so this, you know, plus or minus uh, count, maybe two, we're servoing. So it doesn't look too bad, even though the shield's not connected properly. It must have a good path to earth for the motor case. Okay, so we'll take a look at, uh, this is a good sign, but not a, a, a bad, it's a bad cosine. And so the customer was having a problem with the drive. Uh, we get it set up here and we see 60 volts peak to peak noise. And we wonder why the resolver circuit's blown up. Uh, the diagram is clearly showing the feedback shield not connected to the motor case. Um, but uh, yeah, here's the, uh, here's the resolver circuit, just differentially measuring a voltage. So nothing fancy there. And yeah, don't connect the, the shield to the motor case. And if you want it a little better, the inner braid goes to the, to the, uh, to the ground, but that's, that's irrelevant. But this is the important thing. At the motor, the shield must not be connected to the motor case. And then at the drive, which is this end, uh, it's just all green in there and there's no shield pulled back. So no shield at the, at the drive end. So I'm going to say this is the source of the noise, not that it's very much noise, but maybe this is, you know, if you had a poor path to earth uh, for the motor case or uh, maybe something wasn't quite connected right, you could blow up the drop. Okay, so the first time this has ever happened, I've never seen it before. Usually it's just, you know, I don't get a sine or a cosine and we fix the cabling and everything's good, but... In this case, uh, I have a damaged drive and obvious uh, no shield uh, connected at the drive. And oops, uh, the shield's connected at the motor, contrary to the drawings. Okay, thanks for watching.